going to start by highlighting uh, the Archivist Achievement Award winners. As Lawrence explained this morning, uh, we're taking a little bit of a different approach this year where we're actually going to give the award winners time to show you the projects that they've been working on uh, in the hopes that you can pick up some tips and best practices that you can take back to your own agencies. Uh, and to start this session, I'd like to introduce the 10th Archivist of the United States, David Ferriero. Thank you, Julie, and welcome, all of you, to my house. <laughs> I'm pleased to be here um, this afternoon to speak at my second RACO gathering. Your role in government is an essential part of our mission in preserving the records of the past and the present for study and use in the future. When I spoke to you last year, I talked about some of the challenges that we face in records management. Thanks to you and your continued hard work, we've started to respond to those challenges. We've made progress in improving the ability of the federal government to manage its information. Now I'd like to take just a few minutes to highlight some of that progress. Earlier this year, we released the results of our 2010 records management self-assessment. The goal of this annual self-assessment is to determine whether federal agencies are complying with statutory and regulatory records management requirements. And the responses were not reassuring. They indicated <laughs> that 95% of those federal agencies are at high to moderate risk of compromising the integrity, authenticity, and reliability of their records. They risk improper management and disposition of records. In some cases, they're saving their records but not taking the necessary steps to ensure that they can be retrieved, read, and interpreted. We believe that the records management self-assessment serves as a baseline for evaluating records management within the federal government and it provides a roadmap for its future. Agencies can use data from self-assessments to chart their own programs. We'll use, we will use the survey results in agency inspections and we'll work with the federal records management community to use data and self-assessments and inspections in two ways. First, we'll continue to assess the effectiveness and current practices, and second, we'll develop strategies for improving the compliance of federal programs and federal agencies. What are some of the other things that we've completed in the past year? Last summer, we issued a report on Federal Web 2.0 use and record value. During the writing and research of this report, we received significant responses from agencies that were both interested and willing to participate. After this report was released, we issued an NARA bulletin called Guidance on Managing Records in Web 2.0 and Social Media Platforms. This bulletin reminds federal departments and agencies of their records management responsibilities. This is especially important as we use social media more and more to conduct government business and interact with our public. During the drafting of the Bulletin on Managing Federal Records on 2.0 platforms, we met with the Federal Web Managers Council. We shared both the study and bulletin and began a dialogue about records management of social media. The Council provided input to refine the Bulletin and recognize the value of continuing discussions between our two groups. We're also planning a joint meeting between the Federal Records Council and the Federal Web Managers Council to continue the discussion about the importance of records management in building these critical partnerships. This follows a similar model that was developed for last year's successful joint chief information officers and Federal Records Council meeting. Finally, I'd like to highlight what I believe is a significant positive development for federal records management proposal by the U.S. Office of Personnel Management to create a new occupational series for information management. If approved, this proposal would bring together under one occupational umbrella functions related to records management, FOIA, and the Privacy Act. In doing so, the new occupational series would elevate the prominence of records and information management across government and advance professionalization of these critical career fields. The National Archives strongly supports this, in, this initiative and has been engaged with OPM from the outset, offering our knowledge, expertise, and perspective as a leading agency in government-wide records and information management. All of these activities demonstrate the partnerships we're building across the wide spectrum of stakeholders. These groups, as well as federal departments and agencies, care about records management, and we're reaching out to them in many different ways for their suggestions and help. And I want to give you a sense of how your records 
impact the lives of others. You get to see these records from their creation to the point of transfer, but let me demonstrate what happens years later with three stories. A man walked into our regional center in Waltham, Massachusetts, with a letter dated May 1946, recommending his dad for the Bronze Star. The medal had never been awarded, and the son wondered whether this was an oversight or had the recommendation not been approved. Staff at the St. Louis Military Personnel Records Center made this case a priority and found documentation. Through our efforts, it was determined that he was indeed entitled to the Bronze Star. Just two days after his 100th birthday, it's 63 years after the recommendation, in a ceremony arranged by National Archives staff, local Army officials presented Walter Pierce with the Bronze Star. A private researcher at the archives discovered a declassified U.S. Army record, in U.S. Um, Army records, a list of primarily Jewish unclaimed accounts in a Swiss bank totaling more than $20 million. This list provided proof that information about wartime assets in highly secretive Swiss banks could be found in the records of the National Archives. The discovery led to lawsuits and congressional hearings to force Swiss banks to disclose the assets they'd received and to a reevaluation of Switzerland's neutrality in World War II. It also set off the biggest wave of archival research since Alex Haley's roots. <laughs> in the mid-1970s. And one more story. In Alaska, the granddaughter of an 88-year-old Anchorage resident visited to obtain a certified copy of his 1958 divorce decree. Prior to Alaska statehood in 1959, the U.S. District Court handled divorce cases, so the file was in federal hands. We quickly found the final decree and made her day. <laughs> Her grandfather was in a nursing home awaiting proof of his divorce so he could remarry. <laughs> now on to the Archivist Achievement Awards. As I mentioned earlier last year, I challenged agencies to be more collaborative and to use technology in innovative ways to solve the records management challenges. A number of nominees responded to that call and I'm pleased to be able to provide awards to two agencies. The first Archivist Achievement Award today goes to the Risk Management Agency, United States Department of Agriculture. This agency has deployed a SharePoint electronic record keeping solution to more than four, 500 users in 27 locations around the country. Their system called ERMS, Electronic Records Management System, manages the capture, maintenance, categorization, and disposition of electronic records and it is a model for other, that other agencies can follow. To implement ER, ERMS, USDA completed more than 30 media neutral schedules to support the system, as well as introducing a strong training program with mandatory retraining requirements. In addition, staff in the agency can file various types of electronic records, including email and instant messages directly from their desktop. Finally, they're developing the capacity to move closed and inactive records from other systems into EMRS. To discuss the system more, I'd like to introduce Aaron Tisi, the agency records officer for the risk management agency, USDA, to describe the project. Good afternoon. I just wanted to say how excited I am to be here today and to be able to accept this award on the behalf of Risk Management Agency. It is a great honor and there's been so many people that have worked on this project. It's not just been me, but I've had a great team that's helped me get this award accomplished. So let me give you a little bit of background of where we came from in the agency about records management. I began my employment with the USDA in 2006. A coworker and I were challenged to, with the task of designing a way to file documents electronically and free up some floor space on the, on the rows of Kansas City building. Um, after a bit of research, we realized that there were no official records program in place at our agency. 
At one time, our agency was handled by another records officer, and we were just having a hard time because they maintained several agencies within this department, so it made it kind of difficult. After attending a number of NARA federal record certification classes, I re recall being told that it would likely be a number of years before I could accomplish the task that was set in front of me. They told us specifically it would probably be five or six years before we could ever do this. And again, this was in January of 2007 when I went to the class. As the program quickly progressed and proved successful, and with the tr tremendous management support of our agency and all agency leaders, and with the help of the NARA Targeted Assistance Program, we were able to make this an agency-wide initiative covering 500 employees in 16 locations nationwide. We have also had, like I said, many team members over the years that without their help, this would not have been successful. We've had numerous record schedules submitted. We've had 34 paper schedules, 18 are pending at NARA and 16 have been approved. We've got electronic system schedules, which we've got five system schedules submitted, three pending and two approved. Not sure how easily you're going to be able to see this, but this is our agency file, just a snippet of our agency file plan. Everything we've done in our system is based on a file plan. Everything has a number, everything has a title, everything's got the disposition. So this is, it's a multi-level numbering system, and we have numbers 900 through 5,000, which are for agency records, typically administrative records. And on here, I don't know if you can see it, but you can see the records dispositions, our file plans, 135s, and so on. And then if you go into our 1,000, those are typically administrative records. 2,000 are our budget series. 3,000 are correspondence for emails and things like that. 4,000 is our personnel records. 5,000 is for procurement. And then this is where it changes up a little bit. We've got different agency or different areas within our agency, and we've got it divided by the program. So the 6,000 is for our compliance office only, 7,000 is for our insurance services, 8,000 is for our office of the administrator, and the 9,000 is for the product management office in Kansas City. The reason we do this is because you may have in your different sections of your office the same types of records, right? So, but one office may keep it a different amount of time than what another office does. And I'm sure all of you have seen that. So we've got different record schedules for different ones and different numbers. And when I show you the design of the system, this will make a little bit more sense. But when, you, when everybody logs in, they can only see their records. They can't see my records or anybody else's. It's like having an electronic filing system right there on your desk. So that's just a little bit about the file plan. Here is our actual org chart, and I tried to put it in color so that you could kind of see the four sites. Again, I've, we've got yellow, which is our office of the administrator. We've got the purple, which is product management. The insurance services is blue, and the compliance is green. So when I go and show you the site screenshots, you'll be able to kind of see. Okay, this is one of the home pages. And this one is, you're gonna notice that this is the compliance site, and across the top there are tabs for each site. I don't know if you can see them or not. But now, this is my screenshot. So you can see across there, you'll see all the tabs. If somebody from each of those offices logs in, they will only see their one tab. This is all by name security. So if no one has given me their name to go into SharePoint and add them, they can't see anything. So we've got it locked down pretty securely. The next one is our insurance services site. Again, you can see that they look exactly the same. So everybody sees the same thing. But one thing I wanted to point out is on the left-hand side, you can see this blue box. And if you can see, it's got numbers 900, 1,000, 2,000. Those match up to our agency file plan. Like I said, you'd be able to understand this a little bit more as I talk. The great thing about this is if you notice, this one does have the 4,000 site. But if, let's just say, we can lock it down and we don't want everybody in that area to see the personnel records, because they're secure. If they log in and they don't have access, that 4,000 library won't even be on there. So there's no chance of somebody getting personnel records that shouldn't have access to them. 
Again, this is just the office of the administrator site and then the product management site. So they all look consistent and they all look the same. Okay, we have different input methods of putting things into the record system. We use what's called Knowledge Lake. And we've got Knowledge Lake Capture, which are for large documents, typically 50 pages or more. And these are with high-speed scan stations, which we have high-speed scan stations all over around the agency. We have Knowledge Lake Connect, which is the, the software that's actually on your desktop. This is how we put in emails, instant messages. It's an add-in in Microsoft Outlook. So it goes directly, you put a, hit a button, say add to SharePoint, and it brings up your metadata field. Then we have what's called Knowledge Lake Web Capture. This is, does not require a software. This is a web-based entry. And again, so this is for people that have you know, the small desktop scanners and they only want to scan one or two pages, you can use web capture. And again, it brings up the same metadata fields. Okay, so everybody knows what metadata are, right? Um, the way I describe it is probably one of the best NARA things that they've told me is like having a picture and writing on the back of it. So this is how I tell everybody how to put their metadata in for their records. We have pre-populated codes and retentions so that match our file plan and our USDA file codes. So as soon as you pick a file plan number, it pre-populates with that information from the file plan. We've got mandatory fields, typically subject, user, date of document, you know, those types of things. And it won't let you save it without those. And we have, um, the metadata is identical regardless of the input methods, whether it's capture, connect, or web capture. We have the ability to check multiple boxes, which in our agency, we, we do crop insurance. And so this document may be on peas, carrots, and corn. So <laughs> you want to be able to select multiples. And then we've got location to mark litigation hold, and this is a very important one. We are able to mark all litigation hold documents and hold them without them being destroyed accidentally. And then we, the way the retention module works is you close a document, you date the document of the date it's closed, then our retention module is built into the system, it'll start calculating the days from the date the document's closed, and then it'll bring a workflow up for destruction. This is just a quick screenshot of knowledge like capture and some of the metadata. Like I said, it's for large documents, 50 or more pages. In this software, you're able to scan multiple documents at one time um, let's just say you have a document, a bunch of documents that are exactly one page each. You can say scan, everything's one pages, it'll make 50 different documents. And you can index it all at the same time and lock the fields. So especially if they're the same types of documents. Um, one great feature about this software is also it makes, it runs it through an OCR process and makes all of these scanned images OCR and they're all 508 compliant and are able to be read with readers. Here's our scan stations. Like I said, we have them all over the agency in different areas of the United States. And this is Knowledge Lake Connect. Like I said, you're going to see the metadata is about the same. And you can look there. You can see the box on the right that is red around it. That's a, a mandatory field. And you can also notice that the grayed out ones, those are, like I said, the pre-populated. So the people can't change those. It's according to the file plan. And again, this is on all computers for all users in the agency. It does electronic documents, emails, instant messages. You can batch documents. You can do single file upload. You can do multiple. And again, these are with all of the different areas of the agency. So you can see up here, this has, this one's product management. If you're in a different section of the agency, it would show only that section of the agency. And here's email. Again, it's basically the same way. It's just an add-in from, from the system in email. And you can export the message only. You can export just the attachment. You can export both separately, or you can do them together. The great thing about this is when you open it, it's not a text document. It looks just like an email that you just opened. So one thing about our agency that we're still working on is the IT area right now has things going into Enterprise Vault. And trying to get everybody to used to putting emails in there 
is a whole different scenario. Um, but our enterprise vault retention is set for 999,000 years. <laughs> Anybody guessing that we probably have documents in there that are past retention? <laughs> probably so. So, you know, this is our big push to keep, continue to get everybody to put the documents in the record system. Plus, think about when a person leaves the agency. What happens to their records that are in their email? Well, they're probably on a server somewhere, but are you going to be able to get to them? Probably not, not very easily anyway. So if they're in the system, as long as you have access to the system, then you can get to them. And this is web capture. Again, it looks basically the same. And it's for the smaller documents. And it also goes through the OCR process and makes everything 508 compliant. OK, so let's talk about uh, the search results. Every front page that I showed you are the searches, search pages. And you can add as little or as much metadata that you want to search it. You can search by file plan number. You can search by crop. You can search by subject. You can search by one word. You can search by date. Again, you can do as little as much as you want. But the one thing that I teach everybody in all of my classes is do not put a one word subject on this document. Is you need to put as much as you can. If you just put an X to fill the box because it's a mandatory field, you're never going to find it. <laughs> so again, that's why we have the mandatory fields. So like I said, you can see on here that I've done a search for I think I did a search for Apple. And it comes up, and then you can you know, do it by correspondence. Or one of my favorite searches that I use is how many of you get letters that you respond to the same person over and over and over again? We can search by requester's last name. So not only will you be able to find the last five times you responded to them, you can see what, they've, what you've said each time without going through filing cabinets. And another great thing about the searches is we've got people that travel all over the United States. Have any of you ever traveled and said, you know, I need that document off my desk or out of that filing cabinet? And you've had to go and ask, call back to your office and ask somebody to get you a copy and send it? As long as you've got internet capability, you can get to your files. This is our record disposition retention module. The great thing about this is that, like I said, it goes from the date the document's closed, it triggers the retention, and the other thing is, is it does not automatically de delete out of the system. It's basically like getting a destruction notice from the archives. You still have to put, yes, it's ready to be destroyed, by who, and it keeps that information in our metadata logs, noting that this document was destroyed on this date with this authority. So. And all of our audit logs are turned on in the system. So let's just say somebody takes a document they're not supposed to have or decides to send it to somebody they're not supposed to send it to. Our audit logs are turned on and we know who touched it, when they touched it, when they opened it, where they sent it. So <laughs> we've got real good control of what happens with the records. This is just a screenshot of how the, uh, the disposition works on whether you say yes or no. Um, another thing with this, again, like I said, it's not an automatic destruction. So, a, you know, maybe a litigation just came up and you need to say, no, I don't want to destroy this. We can put no and it'll put it back in the system. I also have the ability to run system reports. This is a tool that I use as a records officer to be able to tell the agency where we're at on who's using the system. So I know by name how many documents you've put in, when you've put them in whether you're totally ignoring my training or <laughs> you know what, what's going on in the system. And I give these numbers out almost every time we have a manager's meeting. And believe me, some people within a week, I'm getting phone calls, OK, now what do I got to do? <laughs> so <laughs> you know, I keep track of who's doing what. Here are our system totals right now. We've got allocated, allocated space for two terabytes. Um, and you can see with each office how much space we've already used. And then as of a total, as of last week, we've got 51,245 documents in the system, which is equal to 68.65 gig. OK, so our future technology, um, what we're expanding to is we've got different systems within the agency that do different things. We've got a system that's called CARS, which is a compliance case files. And they do their own thing in the car system and their legal cases, and they, they maintain it 
in their working system. Once that case is closed, they close it. It triggers a workflow to move that document to our ERMS for the retention time. So that way it goes out of that system. We have all of our documents maintained in one area. We have upgrades to user interfaces to make tasks easier. We're going to be getting, you know, obviously new software as it comes along. Um, we're continually updating the base system architecture with SharePoint. I think we're going to SharePoint 2010 anytime now. And the ability to transfer electronic records to the NARA ERA is, is a hopeful learning how to do that. And then again, we're looking at leveraging multifunction devices like copiers that have the scanning capability to use OCR technology, scan it to a folder, and then go straight to the record system. And that's our system in a nutshell. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron, and congratulations. The second Archivist Achievement Award goes to the National Mediation Board. The National Mediation Board has a mature electronic record keeping solution designed for a paperless office called the Corporate Memory System, CMS. For the past six years, all records have been created and maintained in the CMS. No new paper records have been created. Before the end of this year, they will have no more paper records stored at the Washington National Records Center in Suitland. Filing into CMS is mandatory, and they're pushing toward 100% compliance. To help accomplish this, a performance evaluation element for managers includes successful enforcement of staff using the CMS. The retention periods in the system are based on the 2005 big bucket schedule for all electronic records in the agency, and they transferred their first permanent electronic records to NARA back in February. Back in February. <laughs> February. <laughs> Accepting on behalf of the National Mediation Board is Daniel Rainey, the Chief of Staff. <laughs> um, I'll start out with a confession. I am not an archivist, I'm not a librarian, and I'm not a records manager. I am, for lack of a better term, a mediator. I do dispute resolution. I was hired by the National Mediation Board uh, back in 2001 after consulting with them for a while um, because I'm one of, the, one of a handful of uh, mediators or dispute resolution specialists in the world who was very interested early on from the mid-1990s in the application of technology to the pursuit of dispute resolution. The National Mediation Board handles labor management relations, mediation, grievance mediation, arbitration for the railroads and airlines in the United States. So my, uh, back in the mid-90s, there weren't many of us who were doing mediation and talking about technology and managing information for, uh, for dispute resolution. So they found me, and uh, we started working together, and they hired me in 2001. So what did we find when we got there? Well, there was a lot of stuff. Um, this is, this is where we had paper. The agency is now 76 years old. Um, <clears throat> it was so bad, actually, that the Chicago file room uh, was an OSHA violation. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Uh, came in and said, no, this is dangerous. People shouldn't work around this much paper. It's piled up everywhere. It was actually quite a, quite a nightmare. And uh, I told Ken uh, very early on that my first impulse, not being a records manager, that my first impulse in records management for the National Mediation Board involved gasoline and a match. <laughs> and I still think I might have been right on the front. <laughs> in addition to the paper, we had a number of other things. We had mobile media, we had laptop drives, we had desktop drives, we had network servers, and of course we had personal computers. Um, all of these uh, items contained records of the agency. Nothing was under control, everything was scattered everywhere. And so it was uh, pretty evident that we needed to do something to bring things under some kind of control. One of the things that drove my interest in trying to use technology, remote technology, is that our work is reasonably geographically dispersed. This is a map of the places during the last 12 months that our mediators have held mediation sessions. And most of the time, there are multiple sessions in any one of those places. 
<clears throat> so one of my goals was to have our information available anywhere, anytime. And so, as you said, uh, if you have an internet connection, you can get to the, to the records of the agency uh, without any trouble at all. And the controls are very similar to the ones that you mentioned. And we had the same problems, probably pretty much the same approach to the solutions that you had. The other thing that was driving my interest anyway was that unlike a lot of places where old documents sort of go and die and never get looked at again, we actually use a lot of the older documents that we have uh, in our records. Um, we have arbitration awards that date back to 1934. There are over 100,000 of them in our knowledge store, which is our public-facing version of our records management program. Um, and <clears throat> just as a, a side note, uh, in many arbitration settings, once an arbitrator makes a decision, there's precedent. So the next arbitrator who comes along is at least not bound by necessarily, but at least notices the precedent that was set by the previous arbitrator. In the railroads, where we do most of our arbitration work, that's not the case. Every case is a case by itself. And so it's not unusual for the parties to go back and search, literally, for uh, arbitration decisions that are decades old, not for precedent value, but for the arguments that worked for an arbitrator. <laughs> uh, and so it routinely, uh, I, I think you, if you ask any of the people who do arbitration work for the National Mediation Board, uh, from the parties, rather, they would tell you that the primary source of research for them is our knowledge store and the archive of the uh, awards that are there. On the other side, we have active contract clauses that date from the 1800s. Uh, I was talking at lunch today about a, um, a contract clause that uh, actually pays an extra uh, benefit for going over hostile Indian territory. Um, I'm not kidding. And it is still in place on one of the railroads. And so uh, it's <coughs> our old documents are active documents. You need to be able to get to them uh, without too much hassle. So about six years ago, after the Rayco conference, uh, this is a dog and pony show, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> about six years ago, after the Rayco conference, um, I started looking around for help uh, because I wanted to find a way to, to, to bring all this stuff under control. And so I had uh, five or six, can I forget how many there were, uh, the major players at the time in records management uh, in the electronic field come in and do presentations for us. And what I found very quickly was that there, first of all, there weren't very many of them. Second, they all looked pretty much the same. And third, they were all really expensive. Um, and so one of the things that we did is Ken and I sat down and came up with a business model that would allow a small agency, and by small I mean 52 employees total. Uh, we have a couple of hundred arbitrators who are contractors, but our core group is 52 people. A small agency with a budget that wouldn't even be bar spillage at the Department of Defense. Uh, <laughs> to actually get into this game and do something meaningful. And so we, that's where Ken comes in. And I'm going to turn it over to him for a moment and let him talk a little bit about what we did. When I first wandered into the National Mediation Board, I found a really a broken relationship with NARA. There was, I found some really nifty memos, actually one at NARA, talking about how the people at NMB were totally impossible. There's no way in the world you could ever work with them. And memos in the NMB files which said the people at NARA are totally impossible. There's no way we could work with them. The result has been that for 25 years, no records have been transferred to the National Archives. Um, the disposition schedule was in dispute. <laughs> uh, and I would say in question. <laughs> in question. <laughs> And there was lots and lots and lots of stuff. And there were almost no records. I found this to be very typical, actually, in my work, that I think most agencies have lots of stuff and very few records. I spent three years working in an Air Force project, and I would say the same thing about a lot of the defense places. But in this nice little place <laughs> that I found myself, we decided to take on another way. Your turn, Dan. My turn, OK. <laughs> like a tag team here. Um, first of all, we, we started talking about what it was we wanted to accomplish. And I think maybe the most important thing that we did outside the technology itself and trying to figure out how to apply it was I went, we have the board is three board members who are presidentially appointed. I'm the chief of staff, so I'm the ranking non-political appointee at the board. But the board members said, yeah, you should do this, and we will back you. And so whenever we met resistance in the agency, I could turn to the board members and say, do you want us to do this? And they would say, yes, we want you to do this. 
Consequently, we now have a performance element that, uh, as you mentioned, has to do with uh, compliance. And any time we met a roadblock, there was somebody there to say, yep, the principles we've agreed on, you, you're going to do this. Let's go, go ahead with it. Well, the second thing that we sort of talked about, Ken and I, was that um, we wanted as best we could to manage this in the cloud. We have, um, there are a lot of things that sort of mesh together, as you well know, in terms of ICT, records management, uh, coop plans, recovery, and all of that stuff. And one of the things that we wanted to do was find a way to have things dispersed enough so that if we had a problem at our headquarters here or anywhere in the field, we would still be able to get to the records. So we have, everything is out in the cloud, uh, but it loops back and we have an on-site um, uh, copy. So if anybody who would like to talk about the, the architecture of this, I'm more than happy to talk about it any time, but I'm not going to bore you with it today. But we decided to go out in the cloud. And the other thing we decided to do was hire KAS to take care of the records because I didn't want to have to hire and keep a records manager who would, uh, who would be on staff because I didn't think that was a good use of agency resources when I could hire somebody who knew what they were doing at a level that I needed and scale that level up and down as we needed it. Uh, and so Ken came on and there were times when he's been pretty much full time or more and his staff, and there have been times when he sort of goes away for a while and we don't need him, and then he comes back again when we do need him. So we, we had that, um, that arrangement from the very beginning. The first thing we did was set up what we call corporate memory. I think it was actually your turn, wasn't it? Ken? It was my turn, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> well rehearsed plan here. Um, the corporate memory is, uh, has a lot of similarities to the kind of plan. You've seen a lot of those. I actually met Dan. I was at a RACO conference, and he sent one of his staff by as a as a favor to one of the exhibitors that had a software product and said, and I dropped by the booth and I ended up meeting the staff and then, and I went to their, their demo and I called up the president of the company whom I knew quite well and I said, you know, these people might buy your software but you shouldn't sell it to them because these people don't need your software. They need what your software can do but they don't need to buy your software and maintain it. Secondly, they don't need a records manager. They need somebody who could do something, a lot of the functions and tasks of the records manager. And so the business model we came up with, when he says, hired us to take care of the records, we provide the software, the hardware, the hosting, the consulting, the auditing and evaluation of the system. We do this for a flat monthly fee, and it's a competitively bid contract, and it enables us to amortize our costs over a period of time. It enables us to hire professionals like Deb Marshall, who joined us up here. Many of you know her from ARMA as one of the, on the national board, chair of the education committee, all kinds of stuff, set up the foundation. We could bring in people who could help us at particular times to do what needed to be done, and I could disappear periodically. The corporate memory is the electronic part of that. The, I, part of our deal was all records from the time I walked in the door and we made our deal would be made electronically. No more paper records ever. That was the first deal I required. Secondly, the deal I required of Dan was you got to have support. I'll only do this if the board approves it, not just Dan. And the board are three presidential appointees. It's the perfect agency. It reports to no one except the president. It's in no department. Its budget is a wart somewhere on somebody else's budget. <laughs> uh, and on a, there are many stories about the budget at the NMB. Uh, we also set about, we set up an electronic system and started it working to file documents inside of the records plan, blah, 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 do all that stuff, retrieve it, and so on. That was set up to be shown to you today, and Deb was going to show you about, to get the two ports open, we have to have out of the NARA <laughs> system, it takes three weeks, we understand. We can show you the knowledge store, which is public, and we'll be happy, and we can show you how we retrieve records, because we have some examples that we'd filed for y'all, uh, and we will be more than delighted to set up uh, demonstrations and places. The thing is so tightly controlled, you got to get in a place and you can't get in and out of it unless the ports are open. We revised the disposition schedule. Here, Jim Cassidy was wonderful to work with over several years. And uh, I've worked with a lot of archivists in various ways, and Jim and I have developed a real admiration, I think, for each other as we decided to develop what we think 
was the first disposition schedule that assumed that all records are electronic. In other words, we don't have any paper records. We only have a disposition schedule for electronic records. And we did this five years ago. And then we needed policies. And here's where Dan came in. Dan, we had a provisional policy, and the policy was revised and approved last November. Uh, Deb came in to help us out here to do the training, and we said train everyone. Let me tell you what everyone meant, meant in our agency. It meant we started with the three presidential appointees. It was a half-day training session with five NARA staff. And the basic thing was Jim's presentation to the board members, and it came from Dan's. He said, you know, Harry does not look good in orange. <laughs> Harry's the chair of the board. And so the picture that Deb had was Harry with his orange jumpsuit on behind the bars, <laughs> explaining to them that they were the ones who would go to jail if they did not have the proper records management policy. They listened. <laughs> not only they listened, they got really excited. We negotiated the deal so with them at, that finalized the deal so we could begin to transfer records. Since then, we've transferred 700 boxes of uh, paper records to the custody of the archives, and we've begun the transfer of the electronic records, and from here on out, to only electronic records. We've transferred the most important records of the agency, which NARA did not have any of, which were the Presidential Emergency Board reports. They're being transferred in. Electronic version will be completely available. You can get them on our website now through the Knowledge Door, but they'll be available to the entire community. And we trained everybody from then on, and did took it over after the board to do everybody. All right. So, so where we are now, <clears throat> it says all of our records are under control. That would be an absolute lie if I said that was completely true. <laughs> but it's getting there. <laughs> uh, I do feel that um, uh, if we are hit with a, a um, discovery request on a lawsuit or if we're hit with a FOIA request, it no longer takes the entire staff weeks to find things uh, because of the, uh, the way we've got things under control. So I feel very good about that. All the records we're creating are electronic and they're managed electronically. We have some legacy paper that, because we don't have a huge budget, whenever I find a few thousand dollars here and there, I put it towards scanning those and getting them in, so we're slowly getting rid of the legacy paper. We're certainly not creating anymore. And uh, there's less and less stuff and more and more awareness on the part of our staff about what a record is and why we keep it and why we don't keep some things that might come back to bite us if we kept them. Um, uh, as Ken said, custody of records we're transferring to NARA, and the, the thing that I think is the, the biggest step that we're taking um, is the next step, and that is to integrate our records management program with our case management program so that uh, we have a complete way of, of uh, for any of the mediators or the senior mediators or the board or myself to, uh, to have access to, in a coherent fashion, the records and the documents that are connected to the cases that we work with the parties, and so we're very excited about that. <coughs> Um, what's next? Uh, I think what we're going to do is continue to integrate the case management into our record system. And uh, we've always looked at this as a work process in addition to a records problem. So we're continuing to look at our work processes uh, and we'll continue to try to improve those. And, um, and obviously, uh, as you say, strive toward 100% compliance, which probably is an illusory goal, but it's one that we've got. Anyway. But Dan's the one who evaluates <laughs> all the directors. <laughs> now it's their performance evaluation yeah. written down. Right. So anyway, that's, that's a nutshell of what we're doing. Uh, I'm more than happy if anybody wants to get in touch with me, uh, you know, grab me over at the National Mediation Board. I'm easy to find, and I'm more than happy to do a dog and pony show for you and uh, talk to you about what we're doing if you're interested at all. So thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. Thanks, Dan, and congratulations uh, as well. I hope the next time you do this presentation, you kind of close the loop under the relationship with NARA. You kind of <laughs> left that hanging. Wonderful people, oh, good, glad to hear it. <laughs> and so are you. <laughs> Both of these agencies have implemented innovative technologic technological solutions to managing electronic records. I'm pleased to see their success and hope that it encourages all federal agencies to continue to work your work. Who's next? Maybe next year we can recognize your work with an Archi Archives Achievement Award. Now I'll turn the panel back over to Julie. And it, it looks like we have about 10 minutes for questions, so if anyone has a question, now is the time. Just 
one down here. I wonder if there's one. Susan has one. The lights are just wonderful. <laughs> I'm going to wait for the mic to make it to you. You don't think I have a big mouth? <laughs> NMB. I just want to know if you can get the NFL back to work. <laughs> <laughs> That's FMCS, and I'll tell you what, if George Cohen can't do it, nobody can do it. Well, go give him an assist. <laughs> I, I have a question for, for Aaron. Yeah. I'm over here, sorry. Oh, there you go. <laughs> um, with with the, the system that you created, is, is, uh, what, what portion of that is out of the box to your point, and what, and what portion of it is uh, custom .NET code? Actually, everything is out of the box except for the retention module. Okay. Everything is straight out of the box. And then the follow-up question was, and this was short, is, is are, you, are you implying that you're using SharePoint as an RMA, or is there something else in the back end as the RMA? It is the RMA. That's why we've kind of built the retention module. SharePoint's got its own retention module, but because the way it's designed, it left it open for everybody to see everything, or once you closed it, then you couldn't search it. Mm -hmm. So we've got it as a records management, or RMA, but then it's got that closed document with the retention module, and it's still able to be searched and seen even after the document's closed, because you still want to be able to get to it. I think we have, uh, Susan. My question is for um, Aaron yeah. from USDA. Um, it's a, a course about money. About money. Um, my question is, uh, and I remember you saying you had about 500 users. Um, what was the cost, hardware, software, and integration services to um, get your system up and running, and then your ongoing O&M, if you can share that? Um, I think, if, if I remember off the top of my head, it was about 600000 to design the system, buy all the software and get everything up and running. And I think on an annual basis we've put, I think it's 10 or 15,000 for license renewals. It's not, not a lot compared to what I've seen out there because it is Microsoft Office based and SharePoint based. Thank you. get a microphone <laughs> you can project <laughs> we can hear you she's right in the middle <laughs> okay thank you uh, I wanted to know how many uh, people or um, did you have a team of folk who helped put this all together and who's currently maintaining it um, we do have a team um, there's approximately five of us on the team that are that are all the time on this. Um, we've been through several different project managers and going through that type of thing just with agency changeovers, but there's about five of us that work on it constantly. Um, and then we also hired a company to actually design it, and that was part of the 500,000 that we had. And they came in, designed it, but then they're not with us now. It was just to design it and get it started, and then basically we're maintaining it now. Okay, that's great. Uh, I mean, just five of you. Uh, secondly, um, uh, after you put everything together, uh, you said there were how many people who had access to it, or in fact, um, and just hearing you, um, you oversee the whole program or the management of I it? I oversee the entire program, and in fact, one thing I didn't mention is when, when you've got records in there, I know a lot of people worry about people going in and deleting records. There's three people in my entire agency that can delete records, me, my coworker, and one of the IT guys. And that, so if anybody makes a mistake, they have to contact us to, to delete the records. Um, but like I said, there's about five of us that maintain it. One does IT, one does the SharePoint part. Myself and my coworker do the actual records portion of it. And then we've got an, our CIO area. That's great. Thank you. Now, I'll, I'll like, do you have a, a way to capture all the emails, you know, within uh, your organization? And also, do you guys have shared drives where people are creating records? How are you, how are you capturing those? I understand the SharePoint side. Well, what, what we've noticed is we do have shared drives, and that's going to be one of our pushes to kind of quit using the shared drives 
instead of doing a foldering process, we want them to put the records out onto the record system. Again, that's still, you know, getting people used to doing that versus they're used to putting it on this shared drive somewhere. But what we tell them is once it goes into our system, it is not to be edited. It is the official final record. It's not a working system. It's not a workflow. This is the final record. So once it's in there, it's in there. You're not changing it. So we tell them that they can use their shared drives for their working copies and the drafts and, and those types of things, but the final needs to go into the, to the system. Did that answer? Yeah. What your yeah, we do more or less the same thing, but we do encourage them to use it for drafts occasionally. Our legal people don't like to do that, but I know a lot of times, uh, I personally, a lot of the mediators will put draft documents in their personal, <laughs> we have a personal folder that is uh, not under schedule for drafts and that sort of thing, um, and so we can reach them wherever we happen to be. So we, we do that. Our emails uh, actually are on a 180-day turnaround schedule. If you uh, all of our email is, is wiped from the servers after 180 days. So if it's a record of the agency and it's an email, it better go into the, the case management or the, uh, the corporate memory because if not, it's going to go away. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. The other part of the policy is not only the emails, but also the shared drives is where we're going. Yeah, we're hoping to get that policy in for emails too so it doesn't go into that 999,000 year retention that, that they've got <laughs> set. You know, so it, that's. That's where we're going with that. Do you plan to extend your system to do document management, check in, check out, merge control? That I would like to um, right now with us trying to get the system that is going from the compliance case files. We're trying to get that part done, but we're hoping to expand it to do where we can do the checked in, checked out, move it from spot to spot. But with the way we've got the security written, a lot of times they want to send it to somewhere else within the agency. Well, they don't have access to that record site. We were going to do the open agency, have one record system for everybody, but as you can tell, some one office would be like, oh my gosh, they can't see those records. Or no, they can't see those records. These are personal records for just this office. So that's why we did it, the org chart design for every single office, and we can lock it down. Do you, do you drive that security then through Active? Right now, it's just by now, by name, manual, I'm putting them in. And they have to come see me or email me and get approval from their supervisor to have access to those areas. I think we have time for two more questions. Oh, I have a question for Daniel Rainey. Um, I think at the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned you no longer had paper records at the Federal Records Center. Can you talk about how you achieved that? <laughs> <laughs> that was where the gasoline came. That, yeah, that was where the gasoline came. <laughs> um, uh, I would I would say that a lot of what we had stored wasn't really didn't didn't really fall into the definition of record. It was stuff. We had copies of annual reports that we had elsewhere. We had tons of things, and we we I'll let Ken talk a little bit about specifically what we did. But among other things. We went out to Chicago and asked if we could sample what was there. And we literally took sample boxes and said, is there anything here worth keeping? And uh, the answer was essentially no. Um, and so we just literally had them destroyed and taken away. Um, we've been a little bit more systematic in other places to make sure that we didn't lose some, some things that we needed. But um, basically, the, the record, there was no records program. The, the handling of documents was so bad for so long that it was essentially pointless to even think about what was there. It was, it was just useless because mostly it was duplicative of stuff that was elsewhere. Yeah, Kid. well, yeah, part, it was through the retention schedule modifications that enabled us to throw away most of the stuff in Chicago that was not records. What was interesting was that the stuff that was being kept as records was pretty clearly not records, and the records were not being kept, like the uh, records of the mediations, which is the basic point of the agency. They were not permanent records. and. So the basic deal was, <laughs> and this is what Jim and I worked with the agency on, was to make the mediator case records, which they worried about access to, and we negotiated access restrictions with the archives, which was the basic way that we put together uh, the, the new working relationship with archives. The other thing which we did was to basically, we started no new records about five years ago. Then we, the first scanning money went to scan like the last 20, 30 years of stuff. Anything that was sitting around in the file rooms, we scanned. And, uh, and we're down to almost, by, you know, by the time you do that, by the time you get five years, you've gotten rid of all your three-year records. And uh, 
and then you've got relatively few left. Yeah, the file room that was an OSHA violation in Chicago, uh, we're just now surplusing every single file cabinet in that room. So we're going to make it a meeting room. There's nothing left. Hi. One more question. Okay. Yes. Hi, um, Lisa Harlampus from the Department of State. Um, I would say congratulations for the efforts that you've done. You sound like you've made uh, had real operational success with the collection, with access, with organization. Have you tackled or have you got plans on board for um, either one of you for migration and preservation strategies within the um, repositories? <laughs> yes. <laughs> The, the answer is yes. I'm trying to think about how to start the response. Uh, it's um, on, the, on the public side, on our knowledge store side, everything that goes in goes in as an image and as a text file um, so that it's searchable, word searchable, but it's also an image file if it's uh, a, you know, an arbitration decision with signatures, et cetera. Uh, and so I'm a little more uh, at ease about that because of the way they're stored. And we're doing more or less the same thing on the corporate memory side. And I, my flip answer was going to be, that's why we're handing them back over to NARA, because <laughs> <laughs> they're supposed to be dealing with that in the long term. But it, but it is an issue, and uh, it does crop up even in the, in the short term, in the micro time frames. And um, what we've tried to do is make sure that as we're as we're setting up filing plans, we're creating the most generic type of document that we can out of each of the things that goes in. So at least we have a text version that allows us to recreate the, the substance, if not the look of the document as well. So yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's the, re the retention schedule, for example, in almost all the categories has only two years on site so that we c an electronic record so that we can transfer these to NARA custody and they will worry about the problems of, of being able to find this in five or 10 years. The, the knowledge store, which we mentioned several times, is not a system of records. This came about because it was clear that there's a lot of stuff that was useful that were not records. And uh, that's what we can show you. And, so, and some of these are copies of records, but we don't have to work because NARA is in charge of preservation. So that's our goal is NARA does the preserving we do the day-to-day -day stuff, and we'll keep it as long as it's useful for the agency or for the community that we serve. Uh, but they're in charge of preservations. That's what they know what to do. And that was a lot of the discussion with the board. And the, the training of the board was not just about the orange jumpsuits. It was all about things about how, do, how does NARA preserve things? What happens to it? How do people get it out? Uh, we had the the act, public access people there talking about how do people find things so that the board became comfortable with the idea that their precious records would be better off in NARA's hands than in our hands. Right. And that was basically what they came to for the, well, for the preservation issues. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll go back to the archivist's comment. It, that's one of the reasons it was really important for us to fix that relationship because it had been broken for a long time. And we were getting nothing from NARA, they were getting nothing from us. I mean, they weren't getting any stuff from us, but we weren't getting any service from them either. And so that relationship now is, is very good. And I feel pretty confident that between the short-term things that we're doing to make it available while we really need it, and the long-term things they're doing, that things should be around. Well, I want to extend my congratulations to the Archivist Achievement Award winners as well, and to thank the Archivist for uh, coming here to this session.